Pronto? Sì. Pa, per me va bene. Good morning, everybody. Let's start uh, this this uh, Saturday track, English track. Our first speaker is Marco Paolini, and he's going to speak about Django and Async IO. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, everyone. So for me, Async IO is one of the main reasons um, I would try to move to 3.4. The reason is, uh, finally, we have uh, uh, an async um, framework that is explicit and uh, is uh, leverages um, the basic uh, languages constructs. Plus, it was written by Guido, and it's maintained by him. So uh, it, it will become one of the uh, most important parts of, of the standard library. So uh, pay attention to it. Uh, it's based um, on this uh, PEP 380 that is uh, basically the yield from um, let's say, um, expression. I don't know if it, if it is an expression, but anyways, it's, it's a way of delegating uh, from a coroutine, from a, from a generator, delegating to, to another one, basically. So it is the, um, um, the basic way we can combine uh, generators, and so coroutines in Python. Before that, there was no way of, of doing it. Um, in in 2.7, there's, uh, there's no yield from, as far as I know. I think it was introduced uh, in 3 point, point something, maybe point 0.2, point 0.3. And later on, on top of, uh, of this yield from statement, um, they added uh, this kind of um, package. Python, pure Python package, that is async IO. What did we do before when this wasn't available? Um, what I did, at least, was, um, was doing that. So leveraging gevent and uh, its uh, uh, monkey patching. So gevent did this. Uh, basically, it um, created uh, an async loop, like all async libraries do, and then patched uh, the OS, the OS uh, library, OS socket library, um, and uh, the open, so um, all the file system uh, packages, to make them async capable. So what happened was, Every time you call the socket function, that thing there didn't return right away, but created um, a new greenlet. So, and gave control back to the async loop. And that's really cool to do, but it was a bit magic. In fact, when you use that monkey patching, some of the libraries you were using would not work anymore. And you wouldn't know that why. So there were some libraries that were like G-event uh, compatible, and some were not. And even the G-event compatible um, with this monkey patching here behaved a little bit uh, in, in, in a weird way. So it was, this was uh, quite nice, and I've used it a lot because um, uh, of course, has many advantages. One of the advantages is you don't need to rewrite anything of your code. So basically, even the requests packages package would work in the async way with, with this monkey patching. Um, it was an old 
so good, as I said, especially in packages like uh, uh, database, um, database libraries, like for instance, um, PyMongo. All the connection pooling, uh, since it was thread-based, used to behave very, very, uh, in very odd way with the event until in the end they finally passed it. But it, uh, from my um, experience, it is not there yet. This is the new way. So they came, out, came up with this uh, protocol class that um, you can basically subclass and um, you, you can get this callback called anytime there's some data coming from, uh, from a socket. So this is just an example of how you could use the, um, the new uh, async IO library. And the example is, okay, let's implement uh, a simple HTTP server. You see there, we, we basically create a loop somehow. That's the, the async loop. Um, the loop is something that is always waiting on uh, um, on a system on a system call that is either select or epoll this kind of um, async syscalls, and then when the syscalls returns, it returns to him uh, a list of uh, file descriptors that have events pending. Events can be uh, some data is coming in, somebody tried to connect to a socket, or uh, the write buffer is, is empty, so you can write on it, basically. Uh, thing is, okay, only that part is async, so you're not mon monkey patching anything. You're explicitly putting your async code somewhere. Uh, this is a big advantage because there's no magic involved, but also uh, it's quite a pain because everything needs to be rewritten from scratch. All the libraries need to be written uh, with async IO in mind. Yes, that, that's the part you write. That, uh, that's one way of, of, of doing it, of course. We'll see later how, because this uh, HTTP server will be, uh, I'm going to bring it forward even in the, either in the next slides, and you will see uh, more code about it. Um, basically, that data received is like a callback. If, if you've used Tornado or uh, stuff like that. It's like a callback when, when data comes in. And that's the part you write. That's the, the application code. So it is the components like this. So there's the loop. Um, is completely handled by the library. And there's uh, different implementations. So it works on Windows, I guess, if somebody has ever tested it there. Then there's this transport that is um, a layer of um, uh, abstraction for a socket, basically, that lets you uh, write and read asynchronously. And then there's the protocol that's the code you write on top there. The, the code you write, um, Inside there, inside the data received, you can call other async code. How? Well, uh, you need to put something like yield from and then another coroutine async IO enabled thing. Um, these coroutines, there's a few uh, inside the library. So there's coroutines uh, written to write to a socket, wait for a socket to uh, become available, 
um, you know, waiting for a file script or, or waiting for a subprocess to end. So uh, there's a lot of things that already work there. You just need to understand that every time you write something there in data received, you're the only one that is running on that loop. So if you do something CPU intensive in there, you're going to hog the whole system. So if there's like maybe uh, 500 greenlets and you, you, you loop there for one second eating CPU, then everyone is going to be stopped for one second. But that, that's the same in all uh, async libraries. If you don't want to stop the other guys, you need to call another coroutine. And uh, basically, these coroutines do two things. One is having a callback, um, and the other one is registering for an event inside the, uh, inside the loop. This is very similar to, uh, to all the other, um, let's say, async libraries. Now, let's see the real server and how, how we can implement it. So this here is uh, the same uh, class we've seen before, but uh, has two callbacks. One for data received, that's when um, actually data comes in. This is an HTTP server, so it listens for web requests, for HTTP requests, and always uh, replies with that Pong 200. This one uh, is when Whenever we receive something, we don't even parse HTTP stuff. We just give back the, the response. And that there is when the connection uh, comes in. That's the transport I was talking about. So you don't write to the socket. You use the transport to write data. And every time you, you write data, um, uh, you do something like this. This thing here doesn't write data now, doesn't call, um, this thing doesn't call uh, socket.send here, but just schedules the send inside the loop. And uh, so it tells the loop basically, well, please deliver this response back to the, to the transport that identifies the, the connected socket whenever you can. So this thing here doesn't stop. It just, um, it's just a command for the async loop. And when I close it, um, doesn't really close it. It's, it, it. It puts it in close mode, but it's still, uh, it will be closed when the, all the messages that I've wrote to the transport are sent. So this is quite nice at least uh, in my opinion. This is how instanti I instantiate this server. So um, going back here, this is, let's say, the implementation of my uh, application level code. And this is how, uh, how I run it. So that async IO get event loop either creates a new one or gives the one that's already created. Uh, then we have, okay, th that's a coroutine there. What it does is, okay, uh, open the socket, uh, open the listening socket, uh, bind to the port 8000, and then uh, start listening to it. Register, basically, um, a callback when a connection comes in. Uh, you can ask questions, because um, uh, maybe uh, it's not so clear. But go ahead and ask if you want. So that core routine there is something that could be run asynchronously, asynchronously but we decide to tell the loop to run it right now in synchronous mode. That's what happened in the 
line three, let's say, server equals loop dot run and team complete. So we have something that could be asynchronous, but we decide, okay, this is just a connect thing, um, run it synchronously, and then loop forever. Um, when we run this coroutine, here is written exactly what happens in this code. So, um, wow, this, it's a wall of text here. <laughs> so, um, the thing that really um, nice and interesting is this part. Register the protocol as the reader for the socket. So this thing here, HTTP server, that class there, is the class that implements the protocol and implements our, um, uh, our application layer, let's say. What happens in the internal part of the library? So there's a, a main thread running the loop. There's a socket that is bound and listening. And then there is a, a callback for the read event of the listening socket, just like uh, every async IO library, async library. Let's see what happens when a connection, when a server connection comes in. So the, uh, the OS unlocks uh, the system call. So that main thread is just waiting on EPOL and is waiting there. As soon as a connection comes in, it goes to the next Python line. And at this point, uh, that callback is scheduled to run. Right away, it instantiates a, a new transport for the new connected socket, and it gives it to the HTTP server implementation, telling him, okay, guy, you have this uh, new socket. You can talk to your peer, but if you use the transport methods, you can do it asynchronously. Um, plus, is calling in the protocol's connection made. So then, of course, when we're finished here, there's really two sockets. One is the connected socket. We are uh, waiting for incoming data. And one is the listening socket that is waiting for a new connection. On the, uh, and the, there's two coroutines, basically. There's two callbacks registered. One is the, our own um, protocol implementation. And the other one is the default, let's say, accept um, server that spawns the protocols. Now some graphs. OK, it's not that fast. Could be a bit faster. So. Um, the baseline is the C implementation that I'll show to you later. Uh, there's actually a project on, on GitHub um, I'm maintaining. So there, there's a simple, that simple async server is implemented in, uh, in, all, in a few languages. And uh, some of them run well. Well, you can't go faster than, than C libev. So on my machine, that thing there with a single process can handle uh, uh, well, how much is that? 16,000 requests per second. Doesn't mean anything, uh, but at least can give you uh, a hint on where we are. And we're not that bad, considering that we are doing like uh, maybe we're reaching half of the performance of our pure C implementation considering that our implementation is pure Python. It's not bad at all. Then I dug, uh, I dug a little bit deeper to see what happens there. And 
I found, I found a few um, surprises. This is the, the S trace for um, the HTTP server that you saw before. I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with S trace, but what it is is the list of all the system calls that our own uh, HTTP server is, is doing. So you can see there that the socket there is, is when it creates the socket, that, then it binds it to, to a port. We see it port 8000, 8, uh, and then localhost basically. And then it starts waiting on epoll. Then look, the accept comes in. So that means that someone, someone uh, tried to connect to the socket. Uh, so, in here, we would wait for ages until the new customer comes in and then we unlock. When, when uh, the event is fired, it does the accept, something more that I don't know. Then does this thing here, get sock name, that is, uh, I've seen the other implementation, they don't do it. So, it's a system call that is just, uh, I don't know, maybe for... Um, diagnostic reasons, but the other implementation, Ruby, uh, C, Java, they don't do it. So we might take it out. But the other thing that struck me was this. Look, this is what happens when, um, when a new uh, package comes in. So uh, we're looking at it from the perspective of the web server. So it's done the accept, it's waiting for data, <clears throat> here is waiting for data, epoll wait. As soon as the data comes in, does an M map, receives from the socket, and then remap, sends the response back, and then unmap, and then wait again. Any one of you, uh, I know you do, but uh, <laughs> any one of you <laughs> knows or guesses the reason of those M maps or and on map. I can tell you uh, the other implementations that don't do it. I don't have the, the trace here, but the S trace here, but those in red in the C implementation and even the Ruby implementation are not there. The other system calls are exactly the same. Anyone has any idea? Uh, okay, it, it turns out um, Turns out is that call there. Data equals self sock resp self max size. So that max size there is uh, is big. Is bigger than um, than um, the, the object that can be handled by the Python memory arena. And so malloc is called. And actually, we are allocating every time a packet comes in. We're allocating, like, uh, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, like uh, 200 Ks, no, 20 Ks of buffer. And then we receive uh, maybe uh, 100 bytes. And then we deallocate that buffer there. So there's three system calls that are uh, basically uh, useless. Um, by making that change, and getting rid of that extra M map, uh, it goes uh, 10 to 20 percent faster, and it's just one line uh, inside the the Python code. I'll I'll show you later if we have time during the question and answer. Uh, what else can make it faster? Well, uh, this is the perf uh, perf uh, tool we have on Linux tells you in which function uh, most CPU time is spent. Ruby versus Python. I'm sorry, guys, but Ruby has a, a JIT um, just-in-time virtual machine. It runs way faster than us. We spend 18% of, of the time evaluating a Python bytecode. And that's all in Python, so the first uh, six most time-consuming things, or seven, are all in Python. While Ruby, after the third one, you see already like uh, something outside Ruby taking time. 
Ruby is a bit faster. This is C. If you want to use it with Django, if you want to use this stuff, this stuff with Django, you have a few options. Uh, some are, are quite good, like um, IO, HTTP, Pulsar, even UWSKI and uh, has, uh, I think, I think IO um, stuff in there. Of course, uh, that's just for the, let's say, client connected interface. But then when you need to connect to databases, as I said before, that everything needs to be rewritten. So even the ORM, Django ORM, to, to support a sync IO needs to be rewritten. So we're quite far from having a Django async IO um, enabled thing. Um, for instance, uh, I go a little bit for, uh, yeah. Look, to have it enabled with Django, we should have something yield from user.objects.get or something like that. Um, even the render uh, template system uh, should be async IO enabled because it's reading from the file system, so uh, it should be written that way. All the third party libraries and then all the tooling we've got now uh, needs to take in consideration the fact that we have many greenlets running around and uh, they need to be accounted for. Um, I tried to write uh, a DJ async, uh, Django async um, kind of server, and uh, it, it wasn't a big implementation, so it's like uh, maybe a uh, hundred lines of code. It just received some data from um, the same uh, function you saw before, uh, parses it. This time we parse the HTTP uh, headers, and then well, you see these are these are the WSGI kind of things. Uh, so I get the response from the WSGI app, that's Django, and then I write it to the transport, just like we saw before. So it's quite straightforward. Um, the thing that is not working is this, because here we're not async. This thing here, this response there, is um, taken from Django, from the Django library, in a synchronous manner. So all the queries are done synchronously, even if we're waiting two seconds for the DB to respond, we're not going to handle any other greenlets. We're going to be stuck in there. There's a lot of work to do. And uh, um, so my call is to um, let everyone try to pick an existing I.O. library, whatever package you use. I don't know, could be Balto, could be um, uh, requests, for instance. There's a lot of work already done for us, and try to make I try to make it async IO uh, compatible. If we go down this way, many of the Python modules are going to be uh, radically changed. So there's a huge effort to do, but in the end, uh, well, I think it's going to be it's going to come out uh, quite nice, and we're going to have our code base full of yield from coroutine, so we can brag about it with our friends. Thank you. Thank you. Time for questions. Any question? Um, thank you very much for this introduction to um, Asika. I never used it, and um, so it's really good to have a Good introduction. This is Go. This is, that was just <laughs> about to ask you that. What do you think about you, the, the approach of yield from compared to uh, the one, for example, of Go routines? It, it, I, I think, well, I don't know Go that much, but... You have Go on your uh, screen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's uh, exactly what I... And then a friend of mine helped, even he helped me to write this, so I couldn't do it by myself. I need to ask someone for help. Um, from, from the programmer perspective, it looks very similar. 
looks very similar. Um, well, they, so it, it's much the same, I guess. Their advantage is that they're starting from scratch, so they have this Go thing, and so all the libraries make use of that. They don't have to rewrite anything because they had it right from the start, while we didn't. Uh, but looks very similar. The thing is that Go is 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 much faster. Well, much is a little bit faster. So uh, in my PC, uh, it it ran maybe was thirty percent faster than Python. So yeah, but I wouldn't uh, go into Go. Oh, why not? <laughs> I don't know because uh, I'd rather I don't know. Like th this is the C. This is the C implementation. I wrote uh, this is all on, on GitHub, so maybe later on we can even talk about it. Well, this is 115 lines of code. You see here we instantiate the loop, and then we have uh, all, all the callbacks. Start accept is very similar to Python basically, but we have to. Well, basically we don't have. I don't know. There's something that makes it cumbersome. Maybe because I don't. I'm not good C++ programmer, but. I don't like it a lot. Well, for instance, uh, the Ruby thing. Ruby, Ruby, Ruby is not bad. Um, but see, they don't have it in the standard library. They have something else, just like gevent. Yeah. So I don't think it picked up very much. So event this machine uses libevent or something, or I think it uses libev. Lib libev. Just, just like uh, the new G event thing, but I'm not sure though. I'm not sure. Thank you. Other questions? I have a question. Go ahead. So talking about what you your proposal about changing current libraries. Um, for instance, take, take requests. How would you, would you see the change on requests? What would you change and how? Uh, it's a tough question because um, I think that there's no way of maintaining a single uh, code base for the two versions. That, that's my take. I don't know. So I should be a complete fork. It's quite bad. Yeah, but uh, I mean on the... On the low level, or what, what would you like to see like as um, trans transparent way of doing or let's say... No, 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 uh, it shouldn't be transparent. It should be, uh, well, the philosophy here is that uh, it needs to be explicit. So when you're using a coroutine, when you're yielding, you have to declare it. So if you read the code, you know when it's going to suspend. That, that I think that that's a philosophy here, and, and it I think uh, it makes a lot of sense. So every time you do request dot get, you should do like okay. result uh, response equals uh, yield from request dot get. Yeah. Okay. Or you could you could maybe you could write request dot get async something like that, and maybe just add to to the library. I, but I don't know. I might be saying uh, silly things now. Other questions? Let, don't, don't be shy. Let me take out this Ruby code. Uh, w what do I have here then? I have closure. Uh, let's see. Uh, closure is not bad. They, they all look very similar. Um, closure is quite slow, but since I don't know anything about these uh, languages, I might have done it wrong. So just don't take that figures as good. Maybe they're completely screwed up. And then what do I have here? And I also have um, a closure. Um, oh, I have a, oh yes, sir. Okay. This is node. Uh, ah, no. <laughs> that should be fast. <laughs> okay. This is, they, they, they all look the same. Come on, this is the way we uh, uh, should do it. So, yeah. This is how it should go. Uh, then I have Haskell. Uh, uh, <laughs> a 
I'm not able to comment on this one. <laughs> Works. <laughs> and then I have to pure C. So with Libev, and this one is, uh, well, well, this is 150 line. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this is quite, I wouldn't go that far. Would buy a new machine. <laughs> See, Antonio. <laughs> um, in my opinion, uh, <clears throat> if we want to compare Java-based virtual machines' performance, we uh, we would be we should be able to uh, work on. Um, we, we should consider that Java-based languages and frameworks scale well when uh, they are in a, in a much distributed environment. I'm not sure we can compare Haskell and Scala, which I promise I'm working with, <laughs> uh, with um, these kind of languages, with other languages. Uh. So uh, I, I know because uh, we discussed I, 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 about this before. <laughs> so, um, so this thing is just a single-threaded, single-process um, web server that is returning a uh, hello world. Yes, you, you're basically choking the server. I mean, yeah, exactly. So just, I'm measuring the the speed at which each language is doing system calls. That's it. And in Python, we already saw that we, we are doing some sister calls that don't belong. Um, I don't know about the Java thing. Uh, yeah, but I don't know about Java, so you might be right. I don't know. M me neither. In this hello world here. Uh, but I haven't tried vanilla Java. Uh, vanilla Java. It's just, um, I just tried the closure thing. So it might be just closure that hogs down the, the JVM. I don't know. I don't even know which JVM I'm using. Just call Java from the common line. Maybe it's using some open source thing that doesn't work. I don't know. Mm. Thank you. Grazie.